thank you so much for having me here this morning. It's great to be here on a Saturday morning. Um, I'm glad you've already had your morning tea because I tend to spoil people's appetites when I talk about nutrition and food. But today I'm talking about is the Mediterranean diet good for diabetes? Now you heard earlier Peter Clifton's talk um, and he presented a lot of scientific data. And what I wanted to first establish is what is science. And just to remind people that nutrition, which is what we tell our students all the time, is an actual science. So what is science? This is, science is the pursuit and application of knowledge and understanding of the natural and social world following a systematic methodology that is based on evidence. Which means often as scientists, we make observations about the world around us and then we design experiments to try to look at what we've observed. One of the important aspects which came through in Peter Clifton's talk was the importance of repetition and that it's not just one study that's shown it, but that it's repeated again and again. And then we analyse it and then at the end of that, if that doesn't sound like a really long process, we have to get our data checked and peer reviewed by other scientists who are experts in the world. Now that might be a little bit confusing so I thought as well as telling you what science is, I should also tell you what science isn't. Science does not take into account or concern itself about how you feel about things. Now you've probably guessed from my name, my background is Greek, and one of my favourite foods is baklava, so I would really love it if baklava was healthy. But science doesn't care about how I feel, baklava is not healthy, okay? <laughs> Science isn't what your mother tells you. Sorry, Mum, I've got my mother-in-law in the crowd, so uh, I wasn't sure whether to include it or not, but I'm going with it. So science isn't what your mother tells you. And it's not what your grandmother tells you either. And I know there may seem to be a bit of gender bias in here, but I specifically picked that as my, my father-in-law is also in the crowd, and he is an academic, so I couldn't use him because he's the grandfather to my... Children, science isn't what your neighbours tell you either. Science isn't what celebrities tell you. Okay? And as nice as his food is, and he's got amazing blue eyes, it's not science. Science isn't what food companies tell you either. We had a bit of that with the pink salt, the Himalayan pink salt. They're interested in making money, and, and that's where it ends. Science isn't a personal anecdote or a testimonial. Okay, I don't know if you're aware of this lady, Bill Gibson. She had released a book. She raised money because she claimed she had cured herself from cancer by clean eating. She was later found to be a fraud, and she's been fined. So it just reminds us about where we get our information from when we're considering nutritional information. And Diabetes SA has two dietitians, and those dietitians have been trained in science and dietetics and have studied at least four or five or six years to get the qualifications they have. And it is a science background that they've been trained in. And science isn't what you're told on Facebook. There's a bit of a <laughs> naughty word on that. I'm sure they'll clear that up if they're videoing taping this. So Facebook isn't scientific either. And John Cleese, I'm sure you'll all know who John Cleese is from the Monty Python. And this is perhaps one of my favourite quotes, and I actually managed to get it into a scientific paper I wrote, which was really fun. He said, at the beginning of 2016, I would like 2016 to be the year when people remembered that science is a method of investigation and not a belief system. Okay? It doesn't matter what you believe in when it comes to science. It's what the science tells us and all those rigorous experiments we do to get to that end point. So, what, what are we here for? Well, today I'm talking about is the Mediterranean diet good for you? And what I'm looking at is the scientific evidence when we come to analyse is it good for diabetes? But before we get there, I just wanted to take you through a bit of a journey. Just defining diabetes, I know you all know what it is. It's a chronic condition in which blood, the body can't control blood glucose levels. The other problem is the complications that arise from this, you know, this chronic period of time where blood glucose levels may be high. And so when we're looking at is something good for you, 
First of all, we want to try and make sure that the blood glucose levels are monitored and are stable, and also that we're reducing the complications of the disease. Okay, so I have been a dietitian for 30 years. It's a bit scary saying that out aloud. Um, and when I first trained as a dietitian, I was told by a endocrinologist that we would never, ever, ever see people under the age of 65 with diabetes. When I left to go to the university and I left the um, diabetes clinic I had at Repat Hospital, the last person I saw was a 16-year-old girl with type 2 diabetes. So quite clearly, there's been a lot that's changed and the diet has also changed. So many, many years ago, before even I started practicing, they were recommending high fat diets. And that was because it was the only way they could see to be able to control blood glucose levels. So if we reduce the amount of carbohydrate that people consumed, you were able to reduce the blood glucose levels. But the problem with that was the increased risk of heart disease that was seen with it, because people were consuming saturated fats, which are linked to heart disease. So over the time, that changed. And then we went to a moderate carbohydrate diet, balanced to meet all the nutritional requirements. And people often say, well, you know, if I've got diabetes, shouldn't I just avoid carbohydrates completely? And the answer to that is no. It's because that group of foods that contain carbohydrates like breads, cereals, rice, pasta, also provide us with a lot of other critical nutrients for good health. Most importantly, fibre. Okay, colon cancer is one of the most you know, progressively developing diseases in Western countries such as ours, and it's because of the low intake of dietary fibre. So when the dietitian is talking to you and saying, oh look, you need to have the carbs because you need to get the fibre, they're absolutely right. It's critical in reducing bowel cancer rates. And it's one of the most preventable cancers that we have in Western society. Um, additionally, it gives us the B group vitamins, which make us feel like we're energised. They don't give us energy, but they're the key nutrients that make the energy system in our body work. And they also give us a whole lot of other micronutrients like iron and zinc and selenium and iodine and all sorts of other things. So without it, you're running a large risk of not having optimal health. So remember, diabetes is one thing that we're concerned about, but we're also concerned about the rest of your health as well. And by having a complete diet, you're making sure you meet all those requirements. So the question now is about individualising the treatment and the dietary goals to meet all your nutritional requirements to prevent all these other diseases, as well as maintaining appropriate blood glucose levels. And with the popularity of the Mediterranean diet, the question is, can the Mediterranean diet do this? And that's what we'll begin to look at. So, first of all, we've got to define what is the Mediterranean diet, okay? A lot of people will think it's this, which is a euros, okay? Um, bad news, I told you I was going to spoil your appetite. A euros is not a typical Mediterranean diet. And then in fact, growing up, I never knew what a euros was until I got to university. And my non-Greek friends educated me about euroses. So, they are not Greek. You might go, ah, oh, something like this, that looks healthy, it's got burgle, it's got, you know, the herbs in there, it's got the spices in there, it's a white meat. What do people think? Is this Mediterranean? Why not? No fibre. Well, there's fibre in the couscous and there's some onion and tomatoes there. Sorry? No? There's too much meat. Okay, that's the problem with this. The Mediterranean diet is traditionally very low in meat. So this is more what it looks like. It's a lentil soup, very simple, with onion, bay leaves in it, vinegar, maybe some carrot if they had carrots, and that's about it. So very simple food, but plant-based. So when did the Mediterranean diet come out as being important? And it happened because um, this fellow here, Ansel Keys, who was a physiologist living in England at the time, decided to take his university sabbatical, which means taking a holiday and making out you're still working. And he went to Italy. And this is what he observed. So I'll read it out because the writing is a little bit small. Homemade minestrone, pasta in endless variety, served with tomato sauce and a sprinkle of cheese only occasionally served with some bits of meat 
or served with a little local seafood. A hearty dish of beans and short lengths of macaroni. Lots of bread, never more than a few hours away from the oven, and never served with any kind of spread. Great quantities of fresh vegetables, a modest portion of meat or fish perhaps twice a week, wine of the type we used to call Dago Red, <laughs> and always fresh fruit for dessert. Okay, so that was the first description of the Mediterranean diet. And he went on to describe, to prepare it for when we listened to Cherie, about the dancing that also occurred around us. So the eating together as a family and then the activity with the dancing that occurred afterwards. So um, Ansel Keys was really impressed with this because he saw that very few people in this region had heart disease. And so he decided to investigate this a little bit closer. And he conducted the first study to look at diet and lifestyle in men in terms for heart disease. So what he did has had, he had 16 groups of men from seven different countries. And they were aged between 40 to 59, about the time that heart disease may begin to occur. And there were 13,000 men in the study altogether. He had people from Finland, Greece, specifically Crete, and that's important, Italy, Japan, the Netherlands, United States, and Yugoslavia. And what he did was looked at death rates every five years to see what was happening. And these were his findings. The Mediterranean regions, Italy and Greece, had the lowest rates of heart disease. They also had the lowest rates of colon and breast cancer. They had the highest adult life expectancy in the world. And all of these findings couldn't be explained by the educational level, by the financial status, as you can see inside what this home looked like, by the smoking rates. They actually had the highest smoking rates in the world. And I'm not suggesting you start smoking, but all the quality of health care they received was very, very poor. Yet despite all of this, they had the highest adult life expectancy rates. And in particular, it was the group in Crete that had the highest and the best rates and the highest levels of smoking. And that's why we call it the Mediterranean diet. And in fact, sometimes it's referred to as the Cretan Mediterranean diet. So this was his advice from his observations. And I quite like these, some of them are inappropriate, but that's all right. Do not get fat. If you are fat, reduce. Restrict saturated fats. Prefer vegetable oils to solid fats but keep total fats under 30% of your diet calories. Favour fresh vegetables, fruits, and non-fat milk products. Avoid heavy use of salt and refined sugar. Good, not, good diets do not depend on drugs and fancy preparations. I should put in brackets there, paleo P. Um, get plenty of exercise and outdoor recreation. Be sensible about cigarettes. This is the funny one. Be sensible about cigarettes, excitement, alcohol, and business strain. <laughs> and see your doctor regularly and do not worry. So nine out of 10, I reckon, for that. The cigarette one, I think we have to you know, get rid of. So after this study, they wanted to see, so that was an observational study. And Peter Clifton was talking about that a little bit. It means you look at it, what a group of people are doing and see what their outcomes of disease are. But it doesn't tell us if what they did led to that outcome, okay? So they give us really good hints about what's happening, but they don't actually link the two. And what you need to do is an intervention study where you actually change something in a group of people to see if that outcome changes. And so this was the Lyon Diet Heart Study, which was done in Lyon in France. And what they did was tested whether a Mediterranean style diet would confer any benefits compared to the American Heart Association diet. And at that point, the American Heart Association was the gold standard diet for reducing heart disease. Painfully, it was only 20% fat, which is really difficult to do. And if you can manage to do it, it's really boring and not very tasty. The Mediterranean diet was 40% fat. Okay, So quite contrasting levels. And they planned to the observe them for five years and look at death and heart disease. But when you have a study now that where death or heart disease is a major endpoint, the ethics committees want us to stop, well not stop, but look at the studies at different time intervals to see if anyone is being disadvantaged by the group they're being in. And this came about from the HIV studies in the 80s. So when this midpoint analysis was done, the study was stopped. 
because this is what they found. People that followed the med diet, as I'll call it, had the, so these people already had one heart attack, okay? So they were more at risk of a second heart attack. So it reduced their risk of having a second heart attack by 75%. If they had unstable angina, stroke, heart failure, pulmonary or peripheral embolism, it reduced their risk of getting that by 67%. And it reduced any hospital admission, be it you cut your finger whilst chopping the veggies, or you had a car accident, or you fell out of your tree, any hospital admission was reduced by half. Okay, which was pretty impressive. At the time that this data was being released, people were saying, oh, look, this can't be real. Drugs don't do this. So how can the diet do that? Okay, so it was a really big impact. But what people said was, well, the problem with this study is these people have already had one heart attack. So of course they're gonna have another heart attack. They're at higher risk of it, we know that. So the next study that was done called PREDIMED actually looked at primary prevention. If you could stop the initial heart attack from occurring. And so in Spain, approximately 7,500 people who were at right high, right high risk of heart disease were enrolled in this study. They had three groups. Mediterranean diet plus one litre of olive oil a week per person, right? That's a lot. <laughs> the Mediterranean diet with about a handful of nuts per day, specifically walnuts, hazelnuts and almonds, or just the low fat diet, okay? What they found was that those consuming the Mediterranean diet, either with the olive oil or the nuts, had a 30% lower risk of heart disease. So there we go, it was your primary prevention and it was an experimental clinical study. What people said was, well that's a problem because hey, these people live in Spain and they're already eating the Mediterranean diet, but it actually makes it stronger because they were still able to see effects on top of their baseline diet. Okay, so 30% lower risk, as we said, it was done in um, Spain, and this is to make you think maybe this could be my next travel destination. Looks pretty nice. Um, whoops. So what is the Mediterranean diet? This is how it's commonly described. Low in meat, moderate intake of fish, moderate intake of dairy, high in legumes and nuts, high in vegetables and fruits, high in breads and cereals, high in olive oil, and a moderate intake of alcohol. Now, if I asked each and every one of you what you would refer to each of these, you would all give me something different. If I said, what do you think a moderate intake of um, meat would be? Lo sorry, what's low in meat? Anyone wanna have a guess what would be low in meat? Once a week, how much? Show me with your hands. Size of my palm? That's about it. Once a week, meat, the size of my palm, okay? What they actually found is if you talk to people from that generation who lived in Greece at that time, they said once a week, we were lucky to get it once every three months, right, because of the poverty. And obviously they spared their animals so they could produce the eggs and the milk that they needed from it. So there is a lot of interpretation about this. And this is what led to the study that I did with my colleagues. Well, sorry, before I get to that, this is the actual diet, and there's a lot on here, and I'll go through it, but bread, at least six slices a day, either stone ground wholemeal or sourdough. This is what was calculated from their diets. Two pieces of fruit a day, vegetables, about six serves, including wild greens, cooked in tomato sauce, olive oil and garlic and onions and using herbs. Olive oil, 80 meals a day is what you need to be consuming, right? That's a lot. Um, olives, wine, about 100 to 200 meals a day, the red wine or the ritzina. Herbs and spices, look at all the herbs and spices that are used on a daily basis. And they do contain nutrients in them that can be of benefit. Teas and coffee, lots of different types of teas. Fish and seafood, anything that was available at the time. And those were consumed daily, okay? Two to three, sorry, two to three times per week for this lot, fish and seafood, meat, mainly sheep, about once a week, legumes, two to three times a week, nuts, about three times a week, free range eggs, about three a week, uh, milk, normally from sheep or goat's milk, and usually reserved from children, but they made dairy products for it 
for cheese to eat, and the cheese and yogurt, which are the fermented foods. So you can see it's a drastically different diet from what we may eat at the moment. And I've got to add, it's drastically different to what's been eaten in Greece at the moment as well. So this diet really doesn't exist perhaps, except perhaps in villages, isolated villages and islands where they have that environment still around them where they are able to consume those foods and not be tempted by all the westernised processed foods that are around us. So given um, the Mediterranean diet, I'm not going to go through every study that's ever been because there have been a whole lot of them. But they've been shown benefits in many things. I've shown you the cardiovascular disease ones. It's reduced high cholesterol. It can reduce high blood pressure. It's thought to be important for cognition, including depression, metabolic diseases, obesity and overweight, metabolic syndrome, and diabetes, okay, which is, brings us to why we're here. So me and my colleagues were interested. If, if the general public are confused about what the Mediterranean diet is, what are these research groups prescribing when they're conducting these studies? So this was the paper. Um, and so our aim, and this is the sciencey bit, given there is so much in misinformation by the general public regarding what a med diet is, we wanted to see what the health professionals and scientists were recommending in their research studies when they looked at diabetes. So the results, we were able to find six clinical trials that looked at Mediterranean diet in type 2 diabetes. And we restricted it to type 2 diabetes because it's best to make it as tight as possible when you're asking a question. Two of the studies came from Israel and one came from Italy, Spain, Australia and USA. And the studies were of varying sizes, anywhere between 24 to 280 people in them and ranging anywhere from 12 weeks to four years of being asked to be on the Mediterranean diet. The good news is that all studies reported benefits in type 2 diabetes, and I'll go through what those were. So all of them reported some favourable outcome in type 2 diabetes. So four out of the five studies that looked at glycosylated haemoglobin found a reduction in glycosylated haemoglobin, a clinically relevant reduction. Four out of the six studies found a reduction in blood lipids. And the two studies that looked at blood vessel health, which Peter Clifton showed you a little bit about, found reductions, improvements in blood vessel health, as well as improvements in inflammatory indexes, which are often implicated in diabetes as well. So that was pretty good. But then we were curious, we were, how well did they adhere to this diet? And this is a terribly complicated slide. So these are two of the studies, and these were two of the studies that actually did it quite well. And you can see here, they've listed all the things that they were told. So they were told to have an abundant use of olive oil for cooking and dressing dishes. The participants were told how many serves of veggies, fruit, legumes, fish and seafood, nuts and seeds to consume, to preferentially only consume white meat and not have red or processed meats. And they were told to cook with tomato, garlic and onion, that sauce that's thought to be important in bringing out the nutrients. And they were told to dress their vegetables with sauce as well and olive oil. And they're actually also told what not to eat, which is important. This other study here, which was done in Australia, this was also a very good one. And it actually gave specific amounts, not just serves, because serves can be interpreted in many different ways. Especially when you tell your kids, yes, they can have a serve of ice cream. You can see what they'll put out, OK? So here we've got really specific quantities of amounts to consume. And 75 mils of extra virgin olive oil, they were told to have that every day. These other four studies gave very little advice as to what to do. They were just told, eat more fruit and veg, eat less meat, okay? So what this shows is, well, A, even the researchers are interpreting the med diet study quite differently. Okay, which is problematic from a scientific perspective because you want the same thing to have been measured. Um, the majority of studies didn't give the right advice, minimal description of cooking methods, and they just stated, you know, high intake of fruit and veg and a lower intake of red meat. So we saw that as problematic. But on the good side, it indicates that even if they just made a few changes in their diet to try to make it like the Mediterranean diet, they still got benefit. Okay. Um, so that, that is the important take home message because a lot of you gasped at the 80 mils of olive oil. And yes, that is a really large quantity to have every day. 
so you, you, people go, well, if I can't have 80 mils of olive oil, is it worth it? Well, yeah, it is. Whoops, and what you see is that what they're actually recommending, perhaps, is the Australian Guide to Healthy Eating, okay? And I'm sure you've all seen this. Who hasn't seen this? You've all seen, oh, a few haven't? Yeah, this is the Australian Guide to Healthy Eating. It's been put together by um, dietitians, nutritionists, academic researchers, health policy makers, everybody has sat down and they looked at 55,000 scientific journal articles to put this together, okay? So it's not based on what we believe, it's based on what the, those journals told us. And you saw a little bit about what those journals look like from those results that Peter was showing. They had to sift through that data to find out what to go in here. And this indicates that if you follow this plate, if this is what your plate looks like at, for your overall day, you will reduce your risk of death from chronic diseases by about 50%. And it's based on evidence, okay? And you've got free access to this. You don't need to pay anybody anything to get this. Well, you've paid for it through your taxes, so you may as well use it. So this is essentially going back to, yes, the Mediterranean diet is good and it is providing benefits, but don't forget the AGHE, right? It's been developed for the best health outcomes. And we know it gives you reduced risk of colon cancer, reduced risk of hypertension, reduced risk of high blood lipids, reduced risk of diabetes and many other diseases, okay? So this is what the Mediterranean diet pyramid looks like. They've done it as a pyramid, and you can see they've got things that you wouldn't surprise you, sweets up the top, then meat, and then here we've got all the fruit and veggies. Water, coffee, tea. But also, they've added another line in there. Regular physical activity. Eating together. Home-cooked meals. And picking your own fruit and vegetables and gardening, okay? So it's bringing all of the aspects of that Mediterranean lifestyle and just for the record, the word diet, I'm starting to sound like um, my big fat Greek wedding, but the word diet comes from the Greek word theta, which means the way you live your life. It doesn't mean the food you eat, okay? So including those other things are critical. So what are the components? There's many components of the diet. So I'm just gonna pick a few of them which have been shown to have specific benefits. The first one is olives and olive oil, 80 mils, yes. It contains monounsaturated fats. We know that's one of the healthiest type of fats, but it also contains phenols and antioxidants, and it's part of the Mediterranean diet. And it's a critical part of it because there's nutrients in olive oil that you don't find in other foods. Next thing is vinegar, something people often overlook, but vinegar is actually a short chain fatty acid, and it's not digested in the stomach and goes through to the colon. And what happens there is the good bacteria that we want to keep growing actually feed off it and keep growing and they produce things that prevent the colonic cells from becoming cancerous. It also reduces rates of heart disease. So where do you put your vinegar? I'm not suggesting you drink it, but salads, olive oil and vinegar on it as the dressing. Next one is plant foods. Critical, an absolute critical part of the diet. The more plant foods you eat, the lower your risk of disease is. And that includes vegetables, fruits, nuts, seeds, grains, breads, pasta, rice, herbs and spices and teas. All of those are important. They contain so many things in them. I'm, you know, I've just put a few up there. I can't list them all. We don't even know what's in them yet. There's more things that are being discovered. So the more variety you have, the more colours you have, because colours represent the different chemicals in foods, the different nutrients, the, the better off you're going to be. And then, I'm having trouble with this, aren't I? Fish. Fish is also an essential component of the Mediterranean diet. It contains the omega-3 fatty acids in there, which we know are anti-inflammatory, so for anyone who's got rheumatoid arthritis, they've probably been told to eat lots of fish. But it's also anti-thrombotic, so it stops platelets sticking and stops clots happening, so it reduces heart disease, and it's low in saturated fat. So there are many, many components of the Mediterranean diet. There we go. Um, which are going to be beneficial. And as I said, even though those studies didn't adhere to it, the fact that they just ate more fruit and vegetables led to improvements in their outcomes for diabetes. So 
every little change you make will make a huge difference. And the website, I think it's Eat for Health up the top there. If you go onto the website, it's got lots and lots of information about the different groups.